This, I want to argue, taking a huge jump, has largely been the function of images in the, the American commercial media ever since the destruction of the Twin Towers in 2001, and actually, I believe, long, long before as well. The image functions largely, not entirely, for there obviously are important exceptions, but functions largely to encapsulate, to isolate, to concentrate, and to focus one's attention, and above all, to promote a sense of reality as concentrated in individual objects and subjects, as concentrated in meaningful things and entities, so that time and space, as media of possible alteration and change, can then be regarded as subordinate conditions under which individuals can emerge, be located, be identified, and, as we say, take place. This use of the image, and I want to stress that it is not exclusive, nor is it, and that's very important, prescribed by the technical character of the audiovisual media, serves largely to place, to position, and to contain everything that might cause one to look elsewhere, to read and think out of the box as the current American expression goes. That, however, no image can, in fact, be self-contained is something that I believe was revealed to me in those early radio experiences I described at the start of this talk, that a certain indeterminacy and invisibility contributes to the power and fascination of such images that cannot simply be seen. That is something I believe I have encountered very powerfully in literary texts especially those that are aware of their relation to and different from ostensibly transparent, self-contained images. I want, therefore, in conclusion, to look at one such text in which images play a decisive role, not as self-contained portrayals of individuals, but as what I would call theatrical gestures. A gesture gest gesticulates. It does not try to overcome time by containing it, and it does not try to secure the distance between spectator and spectacle. On the contrary, the gesture bears out their interdependence in all sorts of ways, and in this respect, it is inevitably theatrical. What such gestural images constitute, then, is not self-contained narratives, but rather something more like ongoing and open scenarios. Let's take a look at one such scenario, which is inscribed in a novel that consists of nothing more or less than a sequence of such scenes and scenarios. I'm referring to the novel Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. Stern wrote this novel late in his life when he had already fallen ill of consumption, tuberculosis we'd call it today, and as a result, mortality was constantly on his mind. For those of you not too familiar with this novel, it purports, purports to tell the life story of the narrator, who is therefore also the title hero, Tristram, but who then spends most, it then spends most of its time describing the mainly male figures in the Shandy household. Tristram's father, Walter Shandy, his uncle Toby, Toby's servant, Corporal Trim, and Walter's, Walter's physician, Dr. Slop, and the local parson named Yorick, after the gesture that Hamlet recalls from his childhood. When, therefore, the narrator begins his story by regretting that his parents had not minded what they were about when they begot me, and that if they had, I should have made a quite different figure in the world from that in which the reader is likely to see me, what turns out to be most striking about the figure he does make in the novel is that the reader hardly gets to see him at all. Tristram Shandy remains largely invisible throughout the 400 odd pages of the novel, which, as already mentioned, spends most of its time recounting the adventures and misadventures of his elders in Shandy Hall. But if the hero hardly appears at all, at least as an individual figure, this does not mean that images and a certain visuality do not play a dominant role in the novel. The reader is constantly being treated to a series of scenes 
that are highly visual and that indeed evoked illustration by some of the leading painters and draftsmen of the time. The most famous of these is, of course, the engraving by William Hogarth, which was supplied for the second edition of Tristram Shandy, and that illustrates the scene in which Corporal Trim, Uncle Toby's servant, reads a sermon that has dropped out of a book by the great mathematician and engineer, as Walter calls him, a certain Stevinus, a Flemish scientist who actually existed and who introduced, among other things, decimal notation into Western mathematics, but who also authored works on the use of water-filled trenches to defend Holland against attack, something that would play a very important role for Tristram's uncle Toby, who was wounded in the Battle of Namur in, in Belgium in the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Out of one of Stevinus's books now on fortification falls a sermon that Trim is then asked to read to the audience of men in Shandy Hall who are assembled below while above the midwife helps Mrs. Shandy give birth to Tristram, the hero of the novel. So that's the scene that you're seeing there. Now, the appearance of Stevinus here is anything but simply arbitrary. His interest in mechanics and in fortification converges not just with the obsessions of individual figures like Uncle Toby, but with the tension between movement and stasis that marks life and death in Shandy Hall. Movements are constantly being interrupted, blocked from reaching their intended goals, so that there ensues a constant struggle to master movement and get it under control. This general situation is in part what makes the novel so distinctively pictorial, or perhaps more precisely, so distinctively theatrical, since theatrical scenes often involve the effort to interrupt movement in order to channel it in certain unexpected directions. One of the reasons for this tension is that movement in this novel is never innocent or neutral, no more than time or space is, which together serve as the medium of movement. Perhaps the most characteristic movement that pervades everything in this novel is that of the fall. Things are always falling in Tristram Shandy, either literally, for instance, a hot chestnut falling into the open fly of a dinner guest at an erudite meeting and whose warmth causes him at first great pleasure and then increasing discomfort and finally panic and pain, or metaphorically, where th things are always falling out in the literal but also etymological sense of an incident. Events do not merely take place in Tristram Shandy. They fall out, out of the ordinary, out of what is expected, out of what is intended. Tristram himself is almost castrated by a falling curtain rod, which winds up, however, fortuitously and fortunately only circumcising him. All of this returns as the motif of the law of gravity, which Newton had formulated as a universal law some 70 years before Tristram Shandy first began to be published. It was published serially over a number of seven years. The theological resonances of this secularized notion of gravity can hardly be ignored in Tristram Shandy, which unrolls against the background of a constant, if parodic, struggle between Catholic and Protestant views of the world, of life, of death, and of salvation. The result is a complex portrayal of individual persons. On the one hand, they are portrayed as absolutely singular, unique, uh, eccentric, in many ways exceptional, conforming to no rule, 